Thank you so much for that. Um, I, I always love listening to you, and I always love the historical perspectives that you bring in, because um, I just think it, it helps drive your points home. And, and you're right. To me, that paradigm shift is not only the monitoring and everything that you're talking about, but <laughs> bringing all the disparate groups together and focusing, as usual, on our patient um, when they're out of the OR. And that, that in and of itself, I think, is a, is a fantastic paradigm. How... How do you see it being actualized? How do you see it um, uh, becoming ingrained? I can see in vision 10 years from now, we're thinking, oh yeah, this is the way we do it. But how at this stage, when the data suggests as it comes in, hopefully that you're saving lives, how do we actualize this? Yeah, so right now we're actualizing it from the physician models of, there are now dedicated physicians seven days a week who will be available, who are not allowed to be doing anything else other than available to help co-manage surgical patients with surgeons. Now, it's, there's a person power issue that, as I said, we've been doing it for a year with cardiac surgery. We're about to roll it out with orthopedic surgery at the Jarabinsky. Um, and also in that service, there's an inpatient physician and there's an outpatient physician. The inpatient physician has to be available to just acutely help manage all the patients in the hospital also has to take a very active role that one of the things we find in our research, Brad, drug errors when people leave the hospital is the norm, it's not the exception. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things they also have to play an important role is as we transition people out of the hospital, making sure they're ready to go and also that they're going on the right medications. And then at the same time, we have a physician who's full time on the outpatient setting who can rapidly see the patients in follow-up and as we bring in more of that virtual monitoring technology and you know the the remote automated monitoring technology um, that obviously will continue to shift now we bought some of this technology for the the trial but now as a group we own this and we will use it clinically but it's going to keep getting better as i said we're going to get to a place where it's not going to be intermittent so like as an example in the pvc ram trial right now we get vitals three times a day we're gonna to get to a place where we'll have vitals continuously for 24 hours a day. And we're working with um, IBM and other people for using AI in the background because there's so much data and we're gonna to try to understand better the relationship between all these things. So in some patients, you know, if your heart rate's 200, I need to know nothing else, you're in trouble. But for a lot of patients, as an example, who are bleeding or going into sepsis, it's several parameters changing together over time, none of them very dramatic themselves, but over a two hour period, they're actually telling you this patient's heading for trouble in the next five hours. So we plan to have AI in the background of this. So I think like a lot of services, it'll be, you know, stepped. There'll be a first part, which is physicians and being available. Then we'll keep advancing the technologies. Um, obviously, there's a lot of things to work out to make it practical and functional physicians ultimately you're going to have to bill because yeah. it's just a reality that you know you got to be able to successfully bill for this stuff too um you know so we'll have to work through those sort of pathways and the other thing too that we hope brad is that we really want the service to be multidisciplinary in the same way that there's some surgeons who do icu training we're hoping that there'll be some surgeons who will be interested in getting involved with some of this post-operative and transitional care who it'd still be an orthopedic surgeon where most of their life is doing orthopedic surgery, but they may spend six or seven weeks a year where they would be part of that perioperative care service because we really need everyone to bring their insights because people from medicine bring certain insights, people from anesthesia bring certain insights, and people from surgery bring their own unique insights. And similar to ICU, I think it's one of the things that have made ICUs really great is that it's that interdisciplinary nature that has really evolved. And so I'm sure there'll be errors and missteps, but I think it will, it's going to, it, it's already initiated the path and, um, you know, we're on our way to, to get into that place. Yeah. You know, P P PJ, if I jump in too, the one thing that like, so the last four days we've been having events and we had a couple of, of, of events virtually in Sweden where there was at least, at least 25 people who all agreed, um, that we're not likely to make major, major, um, advances in implant types for orthopedics, you know, like surgery A versus surgery B is not likely we're going to see the biggest advances in care. And I think maybe 10 years ago, we thought that all these AB trials would actually lead to some, you know, benefit. And, you know, it, from our own experience, we've seen that majority of our studies just show no difference. So there seems to be right now a wave of 
of surgery uh, and surgeons, at least in orthopedists, I can tell you, that are starting to get onto the, the psychology that, you know, it's going to be preoperative and postoperative care that are likely going to be where the major, major advances are going to happen. And we're also seeing, I think, Herman, you were on that call, possibly, but um, I see Herman here as well, but maybe you can, maybe you can put your thoughts on how, what your perceptive was. But there seems to me to be a real opportunity for us, even like for like remote care generally, even for surgery. So there's the perioperative, you know, medical aspects, but there may be ways that we could be working with you to advance the common orthopedic complications that are often found very late. But if you're finding a way to get to the homes, you may be able to, to, to mitigate some of those risks as well. I, I don't know what others think, you know, Brad or Herman or- Yes, yeah, certainly. I, and I see Hamish um, Raleigh here as well. Go ahead, Herman. Uh, just to, if I could step in, I, uh, you know, thanks for the talk, PJ. It's always great to hear your uh, hear your words. And Flavia, thanks for the, uh, the the primer as well. You know, certainly it was interesting to hear you go through the history and especially talking about uh, initially prior to the days of anesthetic, speed was really valued among surgeons. And you know, like a good surgeon was a fast surgeon. And I have to say that adage, despite having all the changes that you mentioned, continues. And you know, we do a lot of things and interventions within surgical research that focus on trying to do a faster surgery. Now they're still Lots of benefits to having a quick operative time in terms of uh, trying to get more cases done, infection risk, and those kinds of things. But you know, certainly as all these advents have come about, the focus, as you've correctly done, is just shifting away from the operative experience. Even though in surgical, in our surgical research, we're still stuck on that. So I think you know, I applaud that you know you're really helping pull this out and help uh, like, try to have impact on a, a larger scale. Um, but also, you know, a challenge to see what else can we do here. And we're talking about perioperative care and bringing lots of groups together. What's the role of, say, you know, other protective things we know that can help, like, say, social work and integrating some other uh, factors and addressing factors that our patients might struggle with, maybe geriatricians and those types of things beyond just, say, the monitoring of the vital signs that might impact outcomes? Yeah, so I th one thing to be clear is that monitoring of vital signs and parameters, it, it only gets you in the game. You need physicians and healthcare providers that can act on it. And it's not the only thing that matters. And as Mo was saying a moment ago, that Obviously, in our group, we have a big focus on sort of medical complications. At the same time, one of the things I think that could happen through this is that because we're interacting with patients every day, we can be actually exploring whether or not they're doing their exercises. We could be looking and just taking the, the case of orthopedics, looking to see what the range of motion is. We can be looking to push patients to make sure that, in fact, not just simply that we want to make sure that they're you know, doing well from a medical point of view, but in fact, they're progressing as they should. Because the problem that obviously all of us confront is that you discharge a patient, you see the patient two or four weeks later, obviously that's an appreciable time period for some patients where nothing has happened. And it'd be much better to know on day two, nothing's happening and we got to do something to get this patient moving. So I do think, um, you know, come on, that there's, there's room for more than just physicians and that there's other groups that could be involved in this process that could really help patients. And the other thing, you know, I've argued within our group is that, you know, a lot of perioperative medical care is focused on preoperative care. And, and you're going to see within our own group an enormous shift towards a lot less preoperative care and putting the overwhelming focus on postoperative management and transition in the home setting, because that's where the problems happen. And, you know, we need to realign what our resources are so we can most effectively use them. And one of the things we do a bad job in, even on the medical side, is that, just to use the example, um, globally, 18% of patients who come for surgery are active smokers. In our global research, over 50% of the patients, including patients who go for surgery, resume smoking as soon as they leave the hospital. And less than 5% of patients are offered smoking cessation. Interventions, And I just use that as one small point to say that we also need to make sure that we get you out of the hospital, we don't get major complications, but at the same time that we do things to make sure that you get all the benefits from the surgery, so orthopedics, that you're progressing in terms of range of motion and doing your physical activity, but we're also implementing long-term healthcare interventions so you have long-term health and we're not just focused on, we want to make sure you're alive at 30 days. We want to make sure you're alive at 30 days, but we should have a much bigger vision than just keeping you alive at 30 days. And I think to achieve that, multiple people um, would really be helpful in that process. 
You know, PJ, if I can jump in, you know, it's such an obvious thing that isn't happening in orthopedics is, and, and you're well aware of the hip fracture work where, you know, osteoporosis treatment post hip fracture just doesn't get done 10 to 50%. You can see another really, really reasonable secondary prevention sort of a strategy to prevent the second fracture that could be very, very useful in a remote monitoring approach. Um, just as a simple example, there's many like that. Yeah. And that would be part of our goals within yeah. this moment that I understand like you know, the problem is right now, there's so much pressure to get people out of the hospital yeah. and, you know, just sort of turning around in that. But by bringing in a group that can focus on this and have the time to make sure we're implementing all of the long-term secondary interventions that will ensure their health, not just medical, yeah. but also, yeah. you know, osteoporosis, which you could say is medical too, but just all these things can then be incorporated in that, that transition and that part of care. That's where I think we fail patients. And you know, like just from doing the trials we're doing, like there's all kinds of examples where I think I could show you the example and there's no one in the right mind who's a healthcare provider wouldn't say that they want that for their family. You know, the, the, I think it was the second patient we randomized in PVC RAM, this patient had cardiac surgery and the patient goes home the first day, his vitals look fine, virtual interaction with the patient, he's doing fine. The next day, the nurse gets alerted, you know, at eight in the morning because the heart rate's 34, the blood pressure's soft, temperature's low. The nurse, you know, press the button to interact with the patient virtually. The wife answers, older guy, older couple. The wife says, you know, no, he says he's really tired today. He's exhausted. He doesn't want to do the program. He just wants to sleep. I got the vitals. He really wants me to leave him alone. So the nurse has to escalate care to the physician and the physician who was on was more Makuchi. She gave me a phone call. We loop back in to, you know, say you got to call the patient, the, the, the insist to the wife to bring the tablet to the patients we can see them, and the patient's not tired. They have decreased level of consciousness. We have to get an ambulance, get the patient to the hospital. He's got complete heart block and needs an emergent pacemaker. Now, that patient, you know, the, if the wife had just left him alone all night, who knows? The patient may have died, or for certain, would have had a lot more ischemia. And so, you see all that, and like as a healthcare provider, you only need to see one case like that, and you say to yourself there's zero doubt in your mind, you would want that for your loved one, because it's just so obvious that it's better. Um, but, you know, there's a lot to sort out of all these pathways. But I just think what you said earlier, Mo, is right, that we will make advances in surgical approaches. And every now and then, especially when we tend to go to less invasive approaches, like going from open triple A's to right. endovascular was a huge advance. But the real, the real area that's so obvious from the research where we have so much we could do you know, if 25% of people are coming back to the hospital post-discharge in 30 days, you know, and a third of the deaths are happening post-discharge, it's the obvious place we have to focus. Oh, absolutely. Um, Ahmed, you had your hand up. Did you want to say something? Yeah, I just have a quick question. Thanks, Peter, for the uh, presentation. I'm, I was going to ask about the pre-operative care, which you just uh, mentioned. So what do you think, like, uh, would add the value, what do you envision, like, the, uh, the uh, monitoring or the smart view uh, intervention to be implemented in preoperatively and uh, potentially maybe predict people who are be at risk for postoperative complication or even detect or uh, identify people who we could maybe intervene preoperatively and preoperatively and decrease the risk after that? Yeah, um, our... The ability, I think, to intervene on most patients preoperatively and change their outcome, I actually think is limited. And the, the reason is, is that there's, there's too much competing physiology that happens in the first 24 hours around the time of surgery. So as an example, beta blockers are beneficial. They decrease the risk of heart attack, but they drive up hypotension and increase the risk of death and stroke. Um, however, if we had monitors, Maybe we can minimize the hypotension and get the benefits of beta blockers and have good outcomes. So, uh, you know, I think we will make advances in prophylactic measures, but what I really think is that we're going to move to seeing a whole lot less patients pre-op. We're going to use simple biomarkers. nt pro -BMP is one as an example that dramatically predicts who is going to die, who's going to have major outcomes during the surgical setting. So in many ways, it's cheaper and more, it's faster and more efficient than doing you know, preoperative consults, identify who's high risk. Those patients get the monitors. Those patients get the, the shared care models with the perioperative care physicians. Um, you know, we, who knows, maybe things will also emerge with the monitors pre-op, but my suspicion is the monitors are really going to be for helping us 
immediately post-op and you know to get us to 30 days in, in patients. And I think we will see a whole lot less focus on the preoperative and trying to simplify that and use that resources to focus where the problems are, which is postoperatively and transition into the home. PJ, if someone um, has a complication in the first 30 days, what does that mean for their longer term prognosis? So for example, if you're able to save the life in the first 30 days, what's the potential impact if you know if you didn't use that approach? Like what what's been the the general natural history of, of survival after orthopedics uh, or after any sort of uh, surgery? Yeah. So um, from, if you put cancer aside, yeah. um, the v- majority of surgeries that if people don't die of an acute medical condition, the majority of people will do very well. And the reason is, you know, if you just think about all of your own practices, you're rarely doing surgery on someone. You're not going to do an elective hip or knee if you think, you know, they're likely going to be dead in the next, you know, two months for some reason. So most people, if they get through that, will do very well. The other thing that the research really clearly shows is that if you don't get complications in the first four weeks after surgery, um, then you're basically back to baseline and your your expectation in terms of what happens to you is very good for those patients. Um, But if you do get the complications, you're on a very different trajectory. So as an example, as I showed you, there's a lot of patients, 7%, that's one in 14 of our patients age 65 or greater are getting a covert stroke at the time of surgery. And if you get that, your likelihood of cognitive decline is dramatically increased. And you're on a very different trajectory. Now, obviously that opens up a whole new program for us that we're, we've got some ideas of where we think we can prevent and better manage that. Um, but you know, we need to change that outcome. Same thing is that if you get myocardial injury, if you get myocardial injury after surgery, your trajectory in the next two years is dramatically different than if you did not get that. And so again, it just highlights why we need to be much more intensely uh, monitoring for patients, uh, preventing events, identifying them early, preventing from bigger events, and doing much better secondary prophylactic measures to make sure people don't get the long-term complications. Superb. Um, I think Amin wants to make a comment. Yeah, please go ahead. I mean, if you feel like coming on video, do so, or you can just unmute if you'd like. Yeah, no, thanks, Simoid. So I, my comment is about recognizing that the field of perioperative medicine is a special field and a unique field. In the past, you've had a lot of individuals who are doing perioperative medicine as a side gig. So they do mostly medicine and then they'd see perioperative patients occasionally. Uh, there were family doctors, hospitalists, cardiologists. And I think the work that PJ and yourself and others have done is to bring to the forefront that this is a real separate discipline. It requires individuals to develop a core skill set, and it's a unique discipline in that it allows us to work together uh, in interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary teams. So that if we can put together a model, as PJ uh, alluded to in the ICU, if we can put together a model of physicians, surgeons, anesthetists, and all learn from each other and grow with the field, I think that'll be an important addition to the care of patients. Uh, and so the work that you and others have done have really raised this uh, discipline and it's illustrated by uh, PJ being successful in starting a new perioperative division. Uh, that's my, my comment, yeah. yeah. I mean, let me ask you this. When you say that, that, that there's a, a unique, potentially unique set of skills, how, how, would, how would you envision that happening? Like what would be the approach to get, let's say, I'll take a group of surgeons uh, uh, on board to be able to be um, sufficiently comfortable, capable uh, to be able to be successful, uh, let's, let's say on a rotation and a perioperative rotation? Yeah, so you'll start out a little bit ahead of the game than us because you'll know a lot more about what happens in terms of the surgical, surgical procedure, what happens in the OR. Uh, but I think to learn some of the core content related to, to medicine uh, and pain and other things, you're going to have to do some continuing education and then spend, spend, spend some time learning uh, on the wards with patients. Uh, PJ, Flavia, and I and others will put together, along with the division, uh, a scholarship component with regular clinical rounds, uh, with regular invited talks, with journal clubs, where we can all help to grow our skill set. Some of it is going to be individual learning, some of it will be group learning, and a proportion of it has to be bedside learning. So you have to do rotations with the team and learn from each other. Um, And I think it will come with time. Very good. Thank you. 
sorry, sorry, I wanted sorry. to ask you a question, PJ. Could you just talk a little bit about the nuance of virtual care and the nuance of remote monitoring when it comes to individual patients and what you've seen uh, as the PVC RAM trial is unfolded? Yeah, um, you know, again, I don't know what the trial will show, but as I said, there's some things in life, you know, we've all seen this as clinicians, you've seen something and you say to yourself, there's no way that that did not just help that patient. And, um, you know, I'll just give an example. Two weeks ago, I was like, so we do weeks on of call as the virtual care doc working with the nurses and you're on 24 hours a day. You rarely get calls late at night, but, you know, like two weeks ago, like a Saturday night, there's a patient who had a urological procedure here at the Jerovinsky and lived in Niagara. And this patient, you know, called the nurse saying he was having terrible, like eight, nine out of 10 flank pain. And so I got her, we connected virtually so I could see the guy and he was in a lot of discomfort. And, you know, he quickly confirmed for me that he'd been having, you know, dysuria frequency the last several days. He's got this terrible flank pain. And I, um, you know, I'm able to chat with his surgeon. And I said, you know, look, I think this guy probably has a pilo. I'm going to start antibiotics. So I'm able then, he gives me his, his pharmacy phone number. I phone his pharmacy. I order antibiotics. I order some Flomax. I send in a rec that the next day the guy goes and gets a urine test for me, confirms he has UTI pilo. But he starts on that. Now, this guy who was in Niagara, he could have either went to an emergency room and waited four to six hours to be seen in Niagara where he didn't have the surgery or come back to Hamilton or, you know, I'm thinking about this, if this was my loved one, it's just so obvious that I'm not saying that saved his life, but that made his life a lot easier and a lot better. And um, so I think, you know, there's some obvious things. I, I know that you've seen Amin because Amin has been doing a lot of this also that there's cases that you see that it just seems so obvious to you that there's some really positive things that happen for patients. And, you know, just, it's so obvious that it's so much more convenient and effective to deal with things right away now, as opposed to doing this. And I think, you know, Mo, I hadn't thought about it, but you know, what you got, what you and Brad said earlier really makes me think that we're going to have to think within each surgical discipline, like orthopedics, an obvious thing might be working with you to figure out what kind of range of motion, oh, yeah. how much activity we want to see every day that also relates to the functionality of the joint that just happened. And I think, I mean, that's where I think we'll continue to evolve these things as we have more input from surgeons. I, I wanted to ask Flavia if she had comment, because as an example, Dave Wilson spent a lot of time with us. We had Flavia forced us every night to meet like for three hours for three weeks in a row, Friday, Saturday, Sunday nights included, as we worked out the pathways of complications right. at home and putting them into categories of mild, moderate, severe, critical, what to do with them. And Dave gave input and a lot of surgeons gave input in it too. But Flavia, if, I don't know if you want to comment too, that I think, you know, it's those kind of primers that also Mo would allow me. So as an example, as a cardiologist, you know, I'm having to relearn antibiotics. Like Flavia's going to tell me every time, no, don't take that antibiotic. Uh, um, so there's lots to learn, but Flavia has put together a primer. And I don't know, Flavia, if you want to just spend maybe a second telling people about that, and, you know, if people come involved, we'd be happy to share yeah, so I, I think when you build a multidisciplinary team, you, you have different challenges as you have people with different expertise. And I think the key is to build a group that everybody trusts each other and you are also comfortable to say, I don't know, can you help me? And this was the, the intent of our physician group. We, we built a multidisciplinary physician group and we got together people from different areas of surgery and also anesthesia and medicine and cardiology, just try to build up our uh, guidance on how we would manage those complications and how we would do it virtually because everything was new for us. And I think it was a great um, timing having everybody together trying to contribute to that. We ended up building a guideline with most perioperative complications you can see going from falls, delirium, and syncope, and arrhythmias, and hypoglycemia at home, and how would you manage that, and when you would escalate care to go to emergency room, or call 911, or bring the patient to the clinic. Um, so I, I think it was a learning curve for everybody, and it was interesting to 
build the guidelines, share with everyone, and also apply in the practice when you're on call doing virtual care with those patients. And I think it's, it's very rewarding. I think it's a good experience. And I think that's the same thing we are going to experience when we do uh, the shared care model in hospital. Um, and we are saying sometimes surgeons will like do the rotations or anesthesia people. And we need to build a team that you have people with different expertise to offer their insights if you need any, any help. Oh, that's excellent. That's, that's very helpful. Um, there's a question, uh, I think, uh, from Aisha. Aisha, did you want to unmute and ask your question? Hello, thanks so much for your talk. That was very interesting. I'm not a clinician. I have a research background. And, you know, as I'm listening to this, this is very fascinating in terms of um, the potential of the initiative and how much it could really help patients. Um, I'm just thinking about, you know, the long term longevity of a program like this and also the scaling up potential. So, you know, when you introduce a new program such as this, what are some of the things that you recommend researchers to uh, collect information from? For, for, from an evidence perspective. So I think the clinical um, evidence here is very compelling, but um, do you plan on collecting some economic data as well to see, to really show the value of a program like this? And, you know, when you talk about physicians having to bill, ultimately the healthcare system will have to bill for a program such as this, right? So um, if you could just comment a little bit on the evidence side and also um, the specific barriers clinician scientists or researchers need to keep in mind when designing an initiative slash program such as this and the things we should look out for when looking to scale up a program like this. Yeah, uh, really important um, issue. Um, the economics is a big issue to us in this. In all of our trials, there's big economic analyses. Um, it, it's interesting, you know, like obviously the technology is not free. Um, it does cost money. At the same time, ER visits and hospital admissions cost a lot of money. And obviously, if, if we do surgery on someone and they die within two weeks of surgery, that's also a really suboptimal investment, you know, in this. Um, I honestly think that where most of the research is going to have to go, as I said, you know, and I've had this discussion with a lot of people in our group, um, it's obvious to me, and, I, and as I said, I'm sure we'd share cases, like a, a common case, and I'll ask maybe Amin to comment on this, because I've taken over from Amin, and um, you know, the, a common thing that would really affect you is that, um, in, like wound infections. And so you're, you're every day able to see the wound, you're able to track it. And so, you know, identifying early on that, hey, this wound's going in the wrong direction, and you're eating before it's rip roaring sepsis or a joint infection, you know, obviously is a big advantage. And I'll ask Amin to comment on his experience with that in a moment. But just in terms of, it seems obvious to me that it's it's like just, and I, I'll, I'll put, I guess I'll frame it this way to make it really simple. No one has ever done a randomized control trial of whether or not we should have nurses on the surgical floor and the nurses should measure vitals. But there's no way that any of us are gonna say we're not gonna do that because it's obvious to us it's beneficial. And in many ways, I sort of feel like with this technology, it's obvious from cases you help some people. Now, the truth is some people would have been fine. And I think where a lot of the research really has to go to is figuring out who are the ones that stand to benefit the most from the technology and how do we make it more efficient? So at the moment, I think we're throwing, we're probably too heavy on the personnel side, which is costly, nurses. Well, nurses are gonna be a key part of it, but. I think we're going to, have to find ways to make it more efficient. And I think as we get advanced artificial intelligence with continuous monitoring, that in itself will create other efficiencies. And I think a lot of the research and a lot of the economic work is not going to go whether or not this works and whether or not it's better. Like it's, as I said, it's, it's obvious just in seeing cases, it's better, but we're going to have to work through how do we make it more efficient? How do we better identify which patients need it? How long do they really need it? And that's where a lot of the work goes. And there's big, there's big, uh, we have economic groups on this and we'll see, you know, how to do that. But I, I honestly think that's where most of the work has to really go. I mean, I don't know if you wouldn't mind commenting because it's such an issue that's key to surgeons. But again, it's one of these things so tangible. Once you see it, it's just so obvious of what an advance it is in terms of being able to monitor your patients remotely. Um, do you want to comment on, on the issue of infections, I mean? 
Yeah, sure. I'll just make a comment before the infections about diverting costs. So PJ alluded uh, earlier, I think, to uh, the preoperative part of this. Uh, and we know that many patients are seen preoperatively who don't need to be seen. And there's going to be a growing use, I think, of biomarkers to really help us in predicting who's going to get a complication either in hospital or out of hospital. So a lot of that preoperative medical assessment, nursing assessment cost is likely going to be better used postoperatively and in terms of monitoring. So some of the costs will be diverted uh, from that perspective as well. The, the thing that, that I, th I found very helpful with the, with the monitoring is that, you know, we have the option of having uh, very high quality pictures. So you can look at a wound, you can monitor the wound from day to day, you can monitor drainage, uh, you can monitor surrounding tissue symptoms, and you can really be, um, in a position to start antibiotics early if necessary, but also to not start antibiotics and know that there are a lot of situations where you don't need antibiotics, you need better wound care, you need dressings, uh, you need elevation. So the, the use of the ability to talk to the patient, to look at the wounds, follow them clinically, I think has made a big difference in terms of care, in terms of avoiding uh, visits to clinics or emergency rooms. Uh, and in general, um, the results have been very, very favorably received by patients. And I think we've made positive impact in the care of patients. Oh, that's great, thank you. I do want to highlight, I don't know what the trial will show, but uh, <laughs> as I said, like, you know, who knows? I, I think one of the things that is complicated about this research is one of my worries about it, is that there is also a lot of noise. So as an example, you know, I there was a guy I was taking care of last week, we're doing a lot of stuff, you know, like this guy, Oh, oh, let me show this example because this is hilarious. So I'm on service um, and I get consulted to see an orthopedic patient. Now, it's a, it's a tragic story. Um, this guy is Kurdish and um, this guy, uh, he's been in Canada, I think, for about seven years. His English is not very good. He's 57. He's a diabetic. He gets a foot infection, but because of COVID, he doesn't want to come to the hospital. He waits and waits and waits. He finally shows up. He's got gangrene. He ends up with an amputation. I see him because he also gets myocardial injury after non-cardiac surgery. And, you know, when I see this guy, I'm thinking, we, we're just starting the trial. I'm thinking, this guy should, like, this guy could potentially really benefit from this. Um, but his English isn't great. But I talk to the son, and the son is super keen and says, look, we'll be with him every day. We'll do the surveys with him. We'll be there to do this. So the guy's in the trial. The guy who's in the trial and to highlight the problems of this guy's care. So the guy goes home and it means now the physician who's on and the guy is now at home. The guy is supposed to take, I think, three units of insulin in the morning. That's what he's supposed to take for the entire day. This morning, they, they noticed that the guys, because we also get the glucose readings, the guy's glucose is, let's say, two, 2.5. And they contact the patient. He's taken 35 units of R and 35 units of Lantus. And it means the guy who's on. So my first response is, you better come to the hospital quick Amin manages the guy at home, pulls him through the next 24 hours by some goddamn miracle. I don't know how. Um, but it shows, it, it, I mean, part of it is, once I saw Amin did that, I thought, okay, I'm going to try this next time. But I, you know, like, part of it is you need another colleague to show you, okay, you can actually do that. But again, like it just highlighted, number one, who knows, like, you know, what would have happened to this guy. But it was a miracle to me. We were able to do that with this guy. And, uh, you know, kudos to Amin for... Uh, being the most crazy guy to, to, to do that, but uh, somehow he pulled it off. That's actually amazing. Listen, folks, um, we could keep talking for hours, but I am very, very sensitive to the fact that we are now over the hour and I want to be very respectful of everyone's evening and their time. Um, so if there is a burning question, I, I urge you to ask it now, but if not, I will ask both Flavia and PJ to maybe give a, a closing comment before we end the session. Okay, well, um, again, a huge, 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 huge thank you. I mean, it's hard to, it's hard to follow that, PJ, but um, it's a huge, huge thank you to both of you, Flavia and PJ. And I wonder if you might just give a closing comment um, to sum this up. Flavia? Uh, I have a closing comment. So uh, I think the, the issue that Aisha brought up, that it's, it's going to be hard to be available for everyone, and it, this is true. And I think we have to be wise in selecting which kind of patients will benefit from it most. So I just want to bring up for an example of hip attack, for example, that 
uh, we did this trial looking into hip fractures and looking into accelerated surgery versus the standard of care. And we noticed that patients that had a preoperative troponin elevation, it was a big marker of mortality. The patients that had troponin elevation, they had 24% mortality in 30 days. Uh, so this is a, the kind of combination that you could check the patient that has preoperative high biomarkers and T-pro, BNP, and troponins, or the patients that suffer a postoperative complication such as MINS or bleeding or sepsis. These are the patients that we want to be really sure we're going to follow up for at least the next 30 days, because as I show you in the vision data, these are the patients that are most likely to die and we, we can prevent and we can manage them. Great. Thanks, Lavia. And PJ, final comment. Yeah, just, you know, um, I want to, you know, particularly thank um, Amin, who's done an amazing job getting us ready to get going at the Jarabinsky with our new Parapro Care service. And Flavia for did an amazing work in terms of PVC RAM, even teaching a guy like me how to, how to give what antibiotics to what condition. Now, I do look at the feet every time still, but uh, I'm getting better. Um, and, you know, I... I've often thought about this. I'm still not, I still wonder if we were really ready for RCTs in this area. I still think we're learning so much. It really is a new discipline. And Mo, I wanted to encourage you, um, you know, we do want orthopedic surgeons doing this. Um, I will know a little more vascular medicine, but I can teach you that in about three hours and uh, you can teach me the orthopedics. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a new venture and it's, it's been a lot of fun because I, you know, I really feel like I'm learning a complete new area of medicine and how to function in it. And, um, you know, it, 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 as I said, there's no doubt in my mind there's benefit to patients, but there's a lot still to learn and we're still early on in it. And I encourage everyone as they give thought even to some of the things we said, some things may occur to you like it had not occurred to me, but we could and we should spend some time specifically with orthopedics thinking about ways we might want to monitor people in terms of range of motion and how much activity they're doing and the types of activity where, you know, we'd really need your guidance to be involved with that. And then I, I do think, as I said, I think this really can be something where we could really dramatically change the way that surgery looks. I think it can allow us also to get people home sooner, which will potentially save money, and also importantly, have them do better. But we're still at the beginning of this. It's, it's, it's a new venture journey, but uh, so far it's been a lot of fun and uh, we really would appreciate your involvement and your thoughts on it. Thanks. So awesome. Much. Well, I, I can't thank you all. I think for, from all of us, and I'll speak for all of us who have been uh, either quietly or actively listening, I think we've all been engaged uh, and enthralled in the history um, and the fact that um, proud that, you know, that we're, we're involved at least some degree peripherally uh, in potentially a third paradigm. Um, and we'll be able to look back at this hopefully actively and say that we were part of this. So thank you so much, PJ. Thank you all for attending. Um, and we'll have the videos and the content up as soon as we can so you can share this with others. Take care, everyone.